morning, afternoon, or evening, uh, depending on where you are joining us from in the world. Uh, welcome to our microplastics uh, lecture series. Uh, just before I introduce our speaker for today, I want to once again apologize for the technical difficulties that we had last week. In all the times that we've done these lecture series, that's the first time we've ever had a situation where we weren't able to actually connect with our speaker. Uh, but I do want to let you know that uh, Professor Gia's lecture is now up on our website. Uh, and so if you would like to catch up on what he would have spoken about on um, uh, aging of microplastics, you are welcome to go uh, and listen to it from the website. So uh, now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Dr. Veronica Nava. And uh, Dr. Nava is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Milano Bicocha. I hope I, I pronounced that properly. Um, and she's also a visiting postdoc at the Global Water Center at the University of Nevada, Reno in the United States. Her research focuses on the study of the impacts of anthropogenic stressors on lentic and lotic systems through the analysis of long-term trends. She studies microplastics and plastic pollution in freshwater ecosystems, specifically focusing on the effect of these pollutants on the wider ecological context through the study of the interaction of plastic debris with microalgae and the subsequent effects on metabolic traits such as productivity. And I should also add that she's the lead author on a recent paper in Nature on microplastics. So it gives us great pleasure to welcome you to the series today, Veronica. Thank you so much. Thank you for this nice introduction and thanks for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here today. So I will start sharing my presentation. Hope you can see it. Um, yep, that's good. We can see it. Awesome. So what I will talk today about is microplastics in freshwater uh, ecosystem. And specifically, uh, I want to start from the occurrence of these pollutants in uh, lakes and uh, especially lakes, and then go uh, into the ecological impacts of these uh, microplastics and plastics. So um, the outline of the presentation will be uh, these. So we start with a general introduction. I will um, be very short in this part as you're following uh, a series of lectures on this topic. So uh, I guess you really have some understanding of uh, the uh, concept related to plastics and microplastics. And then I will um, talk about the occurrence of plastics in lending systems. And specifically, I will talk about these studies that we have published recently uh, in Nature about uh, plastics in lakes and reservoirs. And then I will talk uh, a little bit about my studies regarding the ecological impacts uh, of microplastics that start specifically with the interaction with microalgae, and then give a little bit of the future perspective of studies. So, when we usually think about plastic pollution, what most of the people think about is marine systems, so this large amount of plastic that can be found in marine systems. But actually what the studies have shown is that a lot of this plastic is actually coming from the terrestrial sources, and especially rivers and effluents have been identified as major pathways for plastics and microplastics. But freshwater ecosystems are not only conveyor belts that bring this plastic from the terrestrial environments to the sea and the ocean, but they can also be impacted by uh, plastic pollution. Despite these, uh, the number of studies that have been done in freshwater ecosystems are still few, and we have not many data about plastic pollution in freshwater ecosystems worldwide. So when we talk about plastics, we can have the larger pieces of plastic and also the microplastics, which usually are classified as plastic smaller than five millimeters. Um, and these microplastics can be uh, directly produced into the micrometer size range. And in this case are called primary microplastics or can originate from the fragmentation of larger plastic items. Um, as a result of UV radiation, weathering, and uh, wind and currents, and so on. And in this case, are called secondary microplastics. Um, we have to say that uh, microplastic research, plastics and microplastic research, is still a, um, a new uh, research field. 
And what is that it's happening is that there is a lack of consensus on how we define and we categorize the plastic debris. Um, indeed, we there is no even agreement on which kind of polymers should be included in the classification of plastics. The problem is that that an ambiguous terminology actually results in confusion and miscommunication. And this is a problem because underpin all the progresses that we can do both on the research side, but also on the uh, part of the policy and the manager and the management of this problem. And, and also, um, we do not know much about the impacts of this plastic. So there are many studies that are trying to determine the effects, but many, many of these studies are just considering some specific organism and some specific type of plastics that many times do not mimic the real condition. And specifically, when we look into the ecological implication, we really know uh, a little about these impacts of plastics and microplastics. And this is uh, even more, more true for freshwater ecosystems. So, so far we have identified a couple of gaps. So the first one is a um, lack of standardization. So the fact that we have different studies that adopt different study, it's a different uh, definition, which make very difficult to compare the data. And we have few data on freshwater ecosystems. And the second gaps will is the missing pieces of ecological implication. So to try to address this first gap, gap we uh, performed this study. So um, this is a study that I was mentioning at the beginning, and this is um, recently published in Nature, in which we look at the concentration of plastics in the surface water of lakes and reservoirs. So if you want to access the paper, there is here as a QR code, uh, but I'm also happy to share with you later. So what we have done, uh, the idea was to put together many people to perform a first global standardized sampling campaign to investigate the uh, occurrence and distribution of plastics and microplastics in the surface water of lakes and reservoirs. Um, to do so, we take advantage of we took advantage of uh, Gleon, which is this network of people working on lakes, which is uh, stand for Global Lake Ecological Observatory Network. And we met in a meeting in 2019 in Canada, and we came up with the idea of this project. Um, we put together the people. What we have done was that all the different people that joined the project collected the samples and provided information about the lakes and reservoirs that they were sampling. And all these samples were shipped to the same laboratory. So were shipped to um, my laboratory at the University of Milano Bicocca, where all the, all the uh, samples were analyzed exactly in the same way. So they follow a common digestion procedure, uh, a common um, procedure for polymer identification. So the overall objective of the project was really to have comparable data about microplastics. So to overcome these difficulties that we have in comparing different data when they came, when they come from different study. And to do so, we, um, with these data that we wanted to address different questions. So the first one was to try to understand, first of all, we, 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 what is the concentration of plastics and microplastics in freshwater systems? Then we wanted to understand the futures of these plastics, so uh, which were their characteristics, their shape, their color, their polymeric composition. And then we wanted to try uh, to see if there was a relationship between the abundance of microplastics and the future of both the lake and the watershed. Uh, to try to understand if there are some factors that can more likely influence the abundance of microplastics in freshwater. So uh, to collect the samples, we use plankton net um, in, and we focus just on the larger size of microplastics, so above a 250 micrometer. We perform three different parallel trolls in each lake to have replicates, and this sampling occurs in the pelagic zone near the measure outflowing system to have a, a kind of synthesis of the whole uh, lake. So after these, we uh, all the samples have a said um, have a said um, arrive at 
at our laboratory. And so we perform exactly the same procedure. So the first step was a wet sieving with a 250 micrometer mesh size. It was then to be sure that we align like the minimum size uh, of the samples across uh, of, of the samples across all the different sites. As a second step, we treat we treat the um, the samples with hydrogen peroxide. Um, um, in this way, we wanted to remove the uh, organic particles that we're not interested in. And after these, we vacuum filter the samples on uh, glass microfiber filters, and then each filter was inspected under, under dissecting microscope. And all the plastics that we potentially, um, for, uh, it was a, a plastics, we just separate them and put on, on a glass slide. And uh, as a final step, we perform the polymer identification with micro Raman spectroscopy. So we took a picture of each single uh, plastics uh, that we have found. Um, and we classified these plastics based on their shape. Um, you can see here some examples, so some sphere or pellets, some fragments, some fibers, some film. Then we classified based on the dimensions and so the largest dimension, the so-called ferret diameter. And then also based on the color, based on a standard color palette. Um, so to decide how many plastics we have to identify with micromon spectroscopy, we adopt this procedure um, suggested by Ken Z. Uh, in 2019. So we obtained uh, for each sub for each sample, the number of plastics that we have to identify with micromon spectroscopy based uh, on the degree of confidences of confidence that we decided and, and the occurrence that we decide. And um, as I said, we performed the polymer identification using micromon spectroscopy. I don't know if you are familiar with this technique, but it's basically based on this unelastic scattering the Raman effect. Uh, so you basically heat the samples with a laser and then you receive as a response, a, a spectra or something like that. And this represents a kind of fingerprints of your, of your molecule. So, um, you can then identify which kind of polymers um, you have. And this is the uh, the instrument that we used that was available at my university, uh, which was equipped at the time with a, a green laser. And now we have also a red laser. Um, and it's more or less just the parameters that we use, just in case some of you is just using a technique and needs to have some reference for that. And finally, we look at the variables that we, we, we were interested to see this relationship now about the plastics concentration and the different variables of the watershed. So we look at the data, morphological and, and the hydrological variables of the lakes, like basic uh, parameters like the area, the volume, the depth, the thermal regime. We also look at the watershed features, and then we look at the same data, like the presence of waste water treatment plant, land cover and population that we uh, thought it may affect the number of of, uh, of plastics, and so to do so, we we perform some GIS, GIS analysis, and we use some globally extended database. Um, so I I did also use some reference uh, in case you're interested in. Okay, so now we arrive at the results. Um, so this map shows the concentration of plastics that we found. Uh, the first result is that we found plastics in all the lakes that we have analyzed. And this concentration actually spanned four different orders of magnitude. So we started from 10 minus three uh, particles on, on uh, uh, cubic meters to 10, one particles on cubic meters. So you can see there was a large difference in the concentration. And here you can see in the map, like show uh, the distribution of the lakes and where is and, and the concentration. So the blue is one with the lowest concentration and the red with the highest concentration. Actually, yeah, there are two points in red, but they're just overlap on the map. Uh, so we can try to put these results into the context now of the published literature. 
um, if we look uh, at studies that have been done into uh, the uh, oceanic gyres, which are considered this uh, area of uh, large accumulation of microplastics, we can see that some of the concentration, some of the lakes that we have in our studies have uh, at con at concentration of plastic actually higher than the concentration found in these subtropical oceanic gyres. So this is an example. This is another study published in 2022 in which they look at the concentration of plastics in surface water using an net. So more or less the methodology was similar. Um, so as I was mentioning uh, earlier, it is really important also to uh, compare the results we've studied that more or less use the same methodology because different methodology can help to different results. So considering this study in which they use this net with 335 micrometer, they found a maximum concentration of plastics of 1.6 while our maximum concentration was for Lake Lugano of 11.5 and Lake Maggiore 8.2 and Lake Tao 5.4. This is just to give you a scale. It doesn't mean that these concentrations are uh, extremely high. It's just, it's, 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 it's hard to say if they're high or low. It depends on, on in the way in which you look at this data and which are the factors that you look into. So, we also classified the characteristics of these plastics, and we found that the majority of plastic were fragments or fibers. Uh, more than 90% of these plastic belong, this, uh, belong to these two shape categories. And this was not actually very surprising because this commonly found also in uh, previously published research. Especially for the fibers was interesting because we found the presence of uh, uh, fibers also in very remote systems. And so what we have hypothesized is that these plastics can actually come to, the, to this remote system also through uh, atmospheric transport and deposition. It's, for instance, if we look also uh, at these studies, this study was published in 2022 in Science, and they look at the concentration of, um, they, they look at the content of rainfall in terms of, of plastics. And um, and this was done in remote area of the United States, and you can see that the concentration of uh, that the, they also found plastics, and they mainly found fibers. So they also criticized that they also saw like this presence of fibers in rainfall, and there is like an emerging literature about this uh, about the importance of atmospheric deposition and transport for microplastics. So this kind of um, provide like um, a, a background for our hypothesis. But these plastic can also come for different sources. So not only atmospheric deposition, we can have also fibers, <coughs> sorry, that can be released into the water system, for instance, from laundry. So if we have lakes that are uh, receiving uh, wastewater or, water or other effluents, uh, they can have a high content of fibers. Uh, there was this study published by Nappler et al. in 26, in which they show that for six kilogram of laundry, you can obtain uh, into the water, into the uh, effluent, more than uh, <clears throat> uh, 700,000 fibers. So you can imagine uh, the number of fibers that you can have for the people that are doing laundry in a watershed. So, but why do we care about shapes actually? Um, because we have different uh, effects on, on different organisms based on the shape. So we have shape dependent effects. What it has been shown, for instance, in these studies that we can have a, a more toxic effect related to fibers compared to, for instance, beads. This study was done on uh, Cherodaphne dubia and they observed these reduced reproductive act output when exposed to fibers. Um, and it's very interesting because the larger majority of the study that is done on plastics, uh, especially uh, the ecotoxicological studies, are mainly focused on microplastic beads, uh, um, which are actually not very common in the aquatic system. So if you remember the show, the, sorry, the graph that I showed you before about the shape of the different plastics, uh, 
uh, the main shape was fragments and fibers, and pellets were a very, very small percentage of the wall plastics. So um, then we look, uh, as I said, with the uh, microama spectroscopy, also at the composition uh, of the different plastics. And we found the uh, largest uh, percentage to be polyester. And this was followed by polypropylene and polyethylene. Uh, this was also not very surprising because this is in agreement with previous studies that have been published about um, microplastics in uh, surface water. And this will reflect the, uh, uh, the kind of polymers that are mainly used in, in, sh in short life cycles and mass produced products. So if you think about all the different single used uh, packaging, they're mainly done by polyethylene, all, uh, all the bottles of um, like uh, detergents and stuff are polypropylene. And polyester is actually a um, bigger family, which just includes the polyethylene triphthalate, which is the material that is done, that is used to produce plastic bottles, and then which is recycled, usually produce these fibers, that is the polyester fibers that is then used for many synthetic clothes. So, so far we have seen the concentration of plastics, we have seen their characteristics, uh, but now we are moving towards seeing which was the relationship with the lake future and the watershed futures. So we performed this regression trees in which we look at the uh, concentration of plastics and, and all the different futures that the, we, all the different variables that we have included related to the lakes and the impacts and human pressure on the lake. Um, and this regression trees uh, show that the highest concentration was observed First of all, in lakes with a high surface, uh, where we found the highest percentage of plastics. And then when the surface area was smaller than 200 um, square kilometers, uh, then it's split based on the population density. And it's not very surprising, so we found more plastics where we have a higher population density compared to lakes where the population density in the watershed is lower. And this was also uh, confirmed with the um, with the RDA analysis that we have done. Uh, so what we have found is that we have two types of lake that are mainly vulnerable to plastic contamination. And the first one is, uh, the first category is those lakes located in very highly urbanized and populated watershed. And it's not surprising because it's directly linked to the presence of human or human population and and plastic pollution. And the second category of uh, highly impacted lakes uh, uh, were those lakes with a high surface area. Um, and we hypothesized that we found this because we observed lake with a elevated drainage area. Uh, these are also lakes with a very long rotation time that can in some way retain the plastics. And so consider these large lakes are widely used for the population. So. Uh, you're still linked to the presence of human activities, but as these large lakes are, uh, are exposed, like have a higher shoreline, have a higher deposition area for atmospheric deposition, so they can be more vulnerable, more vulnerable than the smaller one. So, uh, which are the conclusion of these first studies that of, of, that I'm showing you? Uh, so first of all our study really underpinned the relevance of lakes as a key component in the global plastic cycle. So we can think about plastic pollution without including freshwater ecosystem. They are key uh, in all the processes related to the transport of plastics into, into sea, but also they can be affected by plastic pollution. And these uh, lakes can be uh, affect, and this plastic pollution can affect their ecosystem services that they provide for instance, many of the lakes that we have included in our study were uh, drinking water resources. Um, and so this can have an effect um, if we have a high presence of plastics. And we do not have uh, to think all the 
um, on a human perspective, but also considering the organisms that live into these aquatic systems. And so we can have effect on, on aquatic organisms and the ecosystem functioning. And there are different processes that can be affected by the presence of plastics. And so uh, we should address this as in freshwater ecosystems. And the last point is that actually we cannot find a lake that can be truly considered as pristine uh, from plastic pollution, as we found plastic also in remote, uh, remote lakes. So overall, these results demonstrate the global reach of plastic pollution and serve as yet another reminder of the indelible signature of humanity on lakes. So before moving on on the uh, second gap that we have identified at the beginning, I want just to um, underline this aspect of the study. So this study was possible actually thanks to a very, I would say, great and important collaboration with all the different crowdfunders. So it was really an international network and all the people who did effort to try to start the plastic pollution in fresh waters. Um, indeed, if you want to have a look at uh, the, the nature uh, issue in which we publish our paper, um, also publish a news and news in which underline how this large scale collaboration can actually be relevant in understanding plastic pollution. And so this is a reminder of the importance of putting together uh, um, the research system strength to uh, to study topics that are certain that deserve uh, um, important attention. So, in the remaining uh, fifteen minutes, I will talk about um, about the ecological implications. So, we have seen that we have plastics in freshwater ecosystem. The question is, what's come next? What which are the uh, the impacts of these plastics? So my uh, my research activity is actually focusing uh, in the most recent uh, time on 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 this whole plastic sphere. So what actually happens is that when these plastics are released into the aquatic environments, this can be rapidly by fall. This happens to many different surfaces in the aquatic environments and can also happen to plastics. So Zeckler in twenty uh three, in twenty thirteen. Uh, define this new term, the plastisphere, to define this diverse community of heterotrophs, autotrophs, predators, and symbionts that can grow on the surface of plastic debris. Uh, so this was new research. To, so this opened this opened to a new research that wanted to look at this epiplastic community. So this community that is growing on the surface of different plastics. So among the different organisms that we have on the epiplastic community, uh, we also found microalgae. So actually the majority of the study are focusing on the presence of bacteria because they use the analysis to look into the presence of the bacterial community. And the, uh, many of these studies are actually neglecting other components like the microalgae and, and many other organisms like fungi that can live on the plastic surface. So I was focusing specifically on microalgae and we published this re um, a review paper in which, research, in which we look at the interaction of microplastics and microalgae. So when you think about this interaction, microplastics and microalgae, you can look at that from two points of view. Um, so from one side, you can have the toxic effect that microplastics can cause on microalgae. So microplastics, especially the smaller size, so this effect is really shape dependent, can affect, can harm microalgae. And specifically, it has been reported some effect on growth, on photosynthesis and morphology of microalgae. But of course, as I was saying, shape is, is fundamental in this process because um should be able to penetrate into the microalgae cells. So when we have larger plastics, we do not observe any toxic effect, just related to the smaller one. But also we can look at these interaction on the other way around. So we can also have the microalgae that biofold these microplastics, and this can have a different effect. So we can see when, when we look in this way, um, the first effect is that we change the density of our plastics. So this can affect uh, the, the positioning of the plastics along the water column. 
they can change the exposition route to many different organisms. Uh, if um, changing, if, if it is floating or if it is sinking into the bottom. In some cases, it is reported that this uh, layer of microalgae can in some way protect the plastic from UV radiation, but in some way kind of protect the plastics from uh, weathering and other processes. It has also been shown that these microalgae can show can change the surface features of these um, plastics, so changing the absorption and desorption capabilities. And then in some cases, specifically for some cyanobacteria, it has been hypothesized like the possibility to hydrolyze this plastic, but these are still like studies that are um, still in, in due course, especially uh, in the environment. And not, mm, there have been studies done uh, in, in laboratory condition, but we need some more study like in, um, in, this, in, um, in this sense. Uh, but, and then, um, but even if we, the experimental results show this reciprocal impact between the plastics and the macroalgae, it is actually very difficult to predict how this impact can manifest on the ecosystem level. So we can see this effect like um, in more basic scale, but it's very hard to scale up. So we, we performed a first study in which we tried to look specifically at this interaction of microplastics and microalgae, so not the whole uh, plasticity, but more specifically into this component. And so we have done, this study was published in Global Change Biology, if you went to have a look, this is the reference, um, and was a mesocosm experiment in which the objective was, first of all, to evaluate if different plastic polymers can constitute this treatable substrate for the development of microalgae. The second objective was to quantify this microalgae biomass uh, on the different uh, polymers that we uh, that we had. And then we wanted to look into the species composition, so which were the algae that were able to grow on the different plastics. And the last objective was to answer to this question. So we were interested in understanding whether substrate driven or environmental factor prevailing shaping the species uh, diversity, both in terms of diversity and species uh, and species composition that we found on the different plastics. So this study was first well thanks to uh, the fund of Aquacosma, uh, which actually founded um, this, it, this is a, a European network which allow people that do not have access to musical facility to actually access one of them in Europe and perform your own uh, experiment. So the experiment was performed at the Berenpon network in Spain and Portugal. Uh, so this system includes many different mesocosma in six different climatic regions. So in, in different climatic regions, so we have semi-arid condition, Mediterranean condition, temperate and alpine environments. And for our experiment, we actually uh, look at five, at four of uh, these uh, six locations. So to prevent the contamination of the ongoing experiment, we prepare some enclosure. Uh, so we put some large microplastics uh, um, visible by naked eye. And we incubate in the different uh, mesocosma uh, at Barium Pond Network network um, into the Barium Barium Pond Network. Particularly, we implemented three different experiment uh, treatments. Uh, so in the first one, we incubated six gram of high density polyethylene. In the second, six gram of polyethylene triphthalate, and in the third one, a mix of these two polymers. So this is just to sum up. So these are the five different sites that we had. Um, the three different ponds per site and the three samples for each pond, which is HDP mix of the two plastics and the PET. So we measure different parameters in each pond. We measure, we measure water temperature, pH, conductivity, turbidity, chlorophyll and nutrients. And then we incubated these plastics and we wait for 30 days for one month. And after this month, the plastics were collected. So we scraped the surface of these plastics uh, and then we preserved the samples in Lugo solution for the subsequent identification in the laboratory. So to identify this IG, uh, we counted uh, the samples under an inverted microscope uh, using the basic ultramoral methods. Method. 
um, and since we had many diatoms, we also prepared permanent slide uh, after oxidation with hydrogen peroxide. And these diatoms were looking with micro optical microscope at 100 magnification. So now we're coming from the results of this part. So uh, here you can see uh, the different biomass that we observe, biomass of microalgae that we observe in the five different sites. So generally we observe a higher value on PET, especially compared to HDP. Um, and when we look at, at these differences, statistically, we found significant differences in total biomass for the different plastic type, and for the magnitude of this difference varies across sites, so depending by on the interaction between plastics and sites. What was very interesting to observe is that in 35 samples that we analyzed, we really found many different species of algae. So we found 232 different species uh, belonging to 144 different genera. So the largest fraction of these microalgae were diatoms, and then were followed by chlorophyll and cyanobacteria and all the other orders. Uh, we also look at the species in terms of uh, diversity. So here you can see data for the species number, Shannon index, universe seems, and, and the evenness, the period evenness. So we found a, an average number of species among the system, among the different samples of 35, with some maximum of 47 and minimum of 27. And, and when we look at the, at the uh, different uh, indices, uh, uh, we observed a slightly higher value on HDP compared to the other, to the to PET especially, but these differences were not statistically um, significant. Another interesting result is that we found some cosmopolite species. So some species that we were able to find in all the samples that we had analyzed. And these are some cyanobacteria like Aphanocaps incerta or other uh, diatoms like Coconais placentula or again Perdilopsis patesti, Agnantidium minutissimum, Plantonium minimetica. So we found different species that were really common in all the different plastics. And consider that we have a kind of large scale. So there were five locations or spread across the brain pond network um, in different climatic conditions. And then we did this uh, an MDS analysis in which we plot the uh, composition, the different species that we have. Um, and you can see with the different shape, it, it is highlighted the different polymers colonized, and with the colors, it is highlighted the different sites. And so what we observe is that we, uh, this NMDS, allows separating the samples based on the geographic position. So except of these two sides that overlap, all the other side was kind of separated. And this separation was also confirmed by Permanav analysis. Indeed, we found a significant difference for the polymer, for the uh, side, uh, not for the polymer colonized. And this help has uh, answering to these questions. So do we have species that select the different polymers or do we have species that are just found because of their environmental factors? So what we have observed in our studies that we found many species linked to the different environmental factors. So they um, like distribute among the space based on, uh, on the concentration of different nutrients. So in conclusion, like from these studies, what we get is that the biofueling actually occur in all the microplastics that we incubated, uh, regardless the size that we choose or the plastic polymers. And we identify a rich and diversified community of microalgae, if you remember the number of species that we had found. Um, and, but, but when we look at the composition of this community, we did not observe a species specificity in the colonization of plastics. This is also in agreement with some previous research and a possible explanation also for this that we look at 30 day uh, as a time of colonization. So what 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 the um, uh, literature seems to to find is that we can have a, a higher differences in the species composition, specifically when we look at the very first day of colonization, because 
um, the algae are growing on the surface uh, as a different layers. So only the first layer is actually real in contact with the polymers that we are considering. So this can be a potential explanation. So when we have a, a more mature biofilm, we can have a more convergent kind of community in the microalgae. So, but this was interesting because we found many different species that can coexist on relatively small plastic items. So what we are moving now as a research and is to try to understand, to expand our knowledge about the biodiversity of the plastic sphere, uh, infrastructure ecosystem, considered both Atlantic and logic ecosystems. And we are interested also in trying to see how this, this community can affect some metabolic traits, since we can have bacteria, but that's why and many other species. So we have already done an experiment in uh, uh, Cambodia. These are some photographs that I've taken the last January. Uh, this is an experiment that we have done in, in the Mekong uh, River, uh, where the amount of plastic pollution can be very high, as you can see here. Um, and we specifically look into these processes. So hopefully we will have also another work uh, about these uh, soon. So with these, I have concluded my uh, lecture for today. I want just to highlight like some free take home message that messages that I think that we can get from this lecture. Uh, so the first thing is we really emphasize the significance of lakes in the global plastic cycle. So for all the different studies or all the different policy that consider plastic pollution, they should also include the problem of fresh water ecosystem and starting from them. Um, as also this fresh water ecosystem can be way more uh, close to the different uh, pollution source and it can also be easier to, trying to address this, this problem in these, in these ecosystems. The second take on message is that there is really a lack of knowledge regarding the effects and the specifically of the ecological consequences uh, of microplastics. So we really need more research uh, in this sense. And the third object and the third take on message is that plastic pollution is actually a preventable form of contamination. So we can try to avoid not all different sources, but many of them can be avoided. So each individual also owes responsibility to contribute to its prevention. So there are different layers in which we can address this plastic pollution, but also as we can have a role in this. So before concluding, I just want to acknowledge the beautiful team, my specifically my advisor, uh, my and my co-advisor from the University of Nevada Reno, and all the different people that have helped in the publication that we I showed you, um, as I was mentioning, this was wouldn't be would be possible without all the, the contribution of all these people. And with this, I've really concluded my lecture, and I thank you for your attention. And feel free to uh, reach out um, now with the chat or the different question, but also by email or whatever means it's more useful for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Veronica, for that excellent lecture and uh, bringing our attention to all these various important issues and also the important knowledge gaps. Um, at this point, uh, as Veronica said, I'm sure she's happy to answer questions. Um, you can do that either by putting on your microphone and camera uh, and asking a question, or you can ask it in the chat. And I think we already have one question from uh, Akil on the chat that maybe you can answer, Veronica. Okay, sorry. So, um, yeah, I've seen a couple of questions here. So, um, like you argue, like diatoms are hard silicate walls. So, is it possible if microalgae? Digest this micro and the plastic can be trapped in their silica cell walls. So yeah, there um there was also a very recent study in study in which they look specifically at the diatoms um and the effects with uh micro uh plastics and it shows like uh, an effect in which 
uh, when we have microplastics, also uh, the walls of these uh, diatoms can become more fragile. So, um, I mean, the effect that we can have with the microplastics and the algae can be very different based on the different species. Of course, when we're talking by diatom, we can have different kind of effect because, as you said, we have the silica uh, cell, um, which can actually um, affect the processes of this interaction. So yeah, there have been studies that are showing these, these process and the diatoms can actually be impaired by different mechanisms and actually the exposure to microplastic can also make them more fragile and also their, their silica content can be um, diminished. I mean, this is just a paper that uh, can come to my, can pop up to my mind. Um, and then I see second question, which say, I had a concerning issue where I would love your opinion. I recently conducted a research study focusing on the identification of microplastics in deep sea sediment samples obtained from the central Indian Ocean basin at a depth of 5,000 uh, meters. As a value of your expertise in this field, I would really appreciate your insight and opinion regarding the potential sources that might have contributed to the position of these microplastics in such remote and restricted deep sea sediment environments. Okay, so um, first of all, it's really interesting to study to look at these microplastics that's in this remote area. And there have been studies that show actually the presence of microplastics everywhere. Um, also, yeah, in the deepest part of the world, they have found the presence of microplastics. Uh, it's way more complicated to see the sources of these plastics when you look uh, um, at a, a kind of re remote system like this, especially in the sea, because you are not so close to put potentially to potential sources. Uh, so what I would like suggest is always to start from the composition of and the futures of these plastics. So based on their characteristics, you can kind of hypothesize. Uh, which can be the sources, uh, but still consider that this plastic can really be transported over long distances, uh, both um, through the ocean currents, but also through the atmospheric deposition. So there are many different processes that can act. So how this plastic actually ended up in the very deep sediments is just a matter of study. Um, and actually the, all these biofooling processes that I was mentioning are processes that can increase the density of these plastics and out uh, in their settlings. And what the research, what the literature is hypothesizing is actually that uh, the sediments are the real sink of microplastics. So uh, what, what, we, what we have observed is that we have a, studies that are showing concentration of plastics, but when we we compare this with the amount of plastic that is produced and released in the environment, there is a missing piece. And so what, what previous studies have hypothesized is that um, really um, the sediment can be a sink and a place where these plastics actually uh, are trapped. And I suppose this is also, there are some evidence also for, for freshwater ecosystem and would be very interesting also to like uh, into this process in freshwater ecosystems. Um, uh, so, ah, and, and another thing that I wanted to mention is that, um, that I forget actually to mention during my, my lecture is that a very important thing when we're looking with, with when we're working with plastics is, is to address contamination. So contamination that us as a researcher can put into our samples because it, it is very easy, especially with the fibers to contaminate our samples. And so this is uh, much more a problem when you're going into the very small size, if you're looking to nanoplastics and stuff like that, or smaller microplastics, uh, but it's always a problem. So you should always address this and have some measurement and way to, um, at least reduce contamination and take contamination into account if it is not possible to eliminate all the contamination. And the last question that I see uh, is how much effective are trash barriers? I'm actually not really an expert about that, so I do not have mm, a lot of experience in trash barriers. 
um, I think it can be very, it can be like, depending, it depends on the site that you have, the futures of the sites. Um, but in some cases, uh, it's really a matter of management of the plastics. Like what I've seen, for instance, when I was studying in the Mekong River is that we have a lot of plastics, but it is also, it is mainly linked to the fact that we are, the, we, they are still developing some uh, trash uh, management systems. So um, if we're collect, we we ended up collecting a lot of plastic using the dye fisheries. So these giant uh, nets that are deployed in the Mekong River, but there was no the infrastructure then to collect all this plastic. So it's a matter um, I have no like specific knowledge about that, but I think this is really important to think about in terms of system and the uh, um, management that can overall uh, um, manage the problem of plastics and can be effective for larger microplastics, but we still have already many microplastics and it's very hard to remove them. So my personal opinion is that it's really important to focus on avoid the entrance of these plastics that can eventually become microplastics or even have microplastics entering. So for instance, in the European Union, um, it has been banned all the different microplastics that you can have like primary one, like the one in the toothbrush or other scraps and personal care products. So these have been banned and kind of uh, in this way, you avoid them to reach the, um, the aquatic system. I hope I have an answer to this question in the chat, but if I didn't also feel free to reach out also later by email and I'm also happy to, to discuss about your, your study if you want to um, have more insights about these potential sources, we can have a discussion also later. Um, other questions for Veronica? D Doug, can I jump in and ask a few questions? Absolutely. Uh, good morning, Veronica. How's it going? Uh, great presentation and uh, two very nice studies, especially, well, both of them were great studies. Uh, for, so I have three questions, if I can. The first one, just a short one. Um, you, the study design, as you mentioned, for that first study, the Global Lake study was a great idea. The issue that we have is that you can't compare across separate studies. So to, of course, coordinate in terms of a common sampling protocol and then carry out the analysis at one location was a great idea. The question I have is, how long did it take to do the analysis at that one location, at your institution? So um, it depends a lot based on the samples that we have, but we had uh, 48 lakes and three replicates for uh, each lake. So it means that we have almost um, 120 samples to analyze. So it was actually a, a work of a couple of years, I would say overall, and I was focusing a lot into this, this project. So um, the first part, like the digestion part is kind of easy. I mean, it requires 24 hours and can be done easily. The longest part were still the uh, visual identification and the microamine spectroscopy. For the visual identification, we weren't able to avoid this. And this is also reported in, in the literature uh, because still, uh, if you are like uh, using a digestion protocol like we use with hydrogen peroxide just to remove the highest amount of some organic interference material, you still ended up having a lot of materials in your filter. So this type of visually uh, identified plastics was uh, still fundamental. And we were able to do so because we are we were looking at the larger uh, plastics, so, so uh, above 250 micrometer. And then of course, also the micrometer spectroscopy was very time consuming. So it depends on the number of plastics that we found in each samples, but when we had many, many plastics, this means that we had to separate all these plastics and then to do the Raman on a, on a so, um, larger fraction, and this could take a whole day just for one sample in some cases, so um, it has been a lot more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think everyone agrees, of course, uh, the bottleneck with microplastic work is that microscope work, it's tedious, it's, it's long, but of course, I think uh, the results are very important. Um, the mesocosm work, 
Yes, Sean, it's very interesting. So I had two questions. One, uh, I mean, did you observe any influence of the microalgae on the buoyancy? So, I mean, did all your plastic sink? Did they all float in the end? And secondly, um, do you think that the different micro microcosms maybe inoculated and influenced the um, microalgae that you actually got in your in your inserts, I would say. So, um, regarding the first question, so for the buoyancy of plastics, uh, we do not observe a change in buoyancy. Um, this is also, you should also consider that they were kind of larger plus microplastics because we're two millimeter diameter, so very, very large uh, kind of plastic. So, um, perhaps it would have need like more time to change and affect their 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 buoyancy, but it's still like um uh, like I suppose that this kind of happen for the smaller pieces where you can actually have a higher surface area and those so they can be exposed to a higher number of microalgae and these can affect the buoyancy. But like for our study, we do not observe this effect. But there, there is plenty of literature actually on the uh, microalgae and the plastic sphere that in general affect the buoyancy of smaller microplastics or nanoplastics. Um, regarding the composition, uh, so uh, we did not observe like uh, any kind of pattern uh, based on the different plastics that we found uh, in terms of species. So. Our, our hypothesis was that actually the plastics were just opportunistically used a new available substrate. So they found the plastics or if they found any other substrate, they would have used, used the, the, the same substrate. So there are some other factors that affect these biofolding processes that are much more linked, for instance, to the uh, smoothness of your, of your substrate. So if you compare, for instance, some polystyrene, to some polyethylene sheet, you can have a difference in the community that develop on that. But this can be much more linked, for instance, to the texture, you know, so to, the, to the kind of surface that you have. Um, so this was really like, our main question was to see if we could see like an effect and the relationship based on the plastics and the community. But we didn't observe any of these. Um, even if it can also be possible that it is much more like the the rare biosphere that is actually affected by these. I mean, this this is what the literature is also uh, pointing out. So it can be that we have just few species, perhaps that are linked to specific substrates. Um, um, so can be can be um, linked to, to this kind of process. So. Um, we did not observe like in general, look at the more specific one. We did not observe like some specific, I mean, we had some specific species on some of the polymers, but we were not able to, to say if they were exactly linked to, to the presence of the plastic. So it's still like a kind of open question, but there are many studies that are also converging, at least in a more mature biofilm in saying that actually the community is converging. And so the, the algae are at least using this substrate like opportunistically. Did, did you notice that? I thought, I thought I saw it in the graph that at one of the locations you seem to have a higher abundance of microalgae. Yeah. Yeah, so we actually, one piece that we were missing from that study was to look into uh, the community in the in the different ponds. So um, we had like some of the musicals with a very higher concentration of microalgae and we were hypothesized that the high, like there can be actually different mechanisms. It can be in one way on, on exactly on the other way and we are actually performing some study to look into that. So how the specific future of the system can affect this plastic sphere. We had differences in the, the biomass in some uh, uh, of the uh, in some of the sites and in some other we had like lower biomass and we also hypothesized that was there was an effect of UV radiation that was limiting some of the algae um, compared to some other side where the UV radiation was lower. So there can be actually many factors and we do not really have a clear answer for all the different factors which are the specific one. But um, we have some more studies, especially in this direction. So that hopefully will help understanding 
how the futures of the system can influence this community and how this influence over large scale and how this influence also the dynamics overall. Thanks very much. Thank you. Other questions for Veronica? If not, maybe I could ask you one quickly. Um, and that is, um, given these uh, algal communities that develop on plastics, particularly, I would say, smaller particles than the ones you used in your experiments, uh, do you think that uh, this would encourage higher trophic levels to uh, ingest plastics? In other words, uh, are, are they likely to be consumed and that then become a vector for transfer of the plastics? Yes, actually, this is one of the other processes that can happen is that these micro, these plastics, when they are biofuel, they become much more um, edible for, for instance, zooplankton or any other primary consumers. So um, they uh, can really uh, actually facilitate the entering in the uh, aquatic food webs because they are just more edible, more um, they're biofuel than with the algae. And there has been reported some effects of food dilution for zooplankton because the prison zooplankton is eating this microalgae, but this has microalgae and microplastics. So it's actually not eating all the microalgae that you would need. So um, there is an effect of food dilution and there can be hypothesized also effect in this sense. So yes, it's also like, I think that this, this, this part, like looking good to at the community growing on this plastic is very interesting. And there are also study reporting the presence of viruses. And so we can have implication that go uh, far beyond just the presence of plastic. So, that's really a kind of complex contaminant. It's complex because we have many different polymers shape. Um, so already as a physical contaminant can be a problem. We It, it can also become a, um, a chemical contaminant because it absorbs um, pops or many other contaminants from the uh, environments, but can also have this community growing on that that can affect different processes. So <laughs> it's complex, but it's interesting to look into these dynamics. Can I, can, I, can I jump in one more question now? Because I think your, your question I found interesting uh, that uh, the biofilm can make them more tasty, the microplastics, which is interesting, preferential grazing, or maybe the more mature the biofilm, the taster they are. Uh, but I have one last question, if I can. Um, uh, Veronica, are you planning any more global studies or was one enough um, or what's next? Yeah, I am. Uh, yeah, actually, like, I I'm thinking about another kind of global uh, study uh, about this part, like this interaction, that would be very interesting, like to see the overall patterns uh, under and not only considering some site specific factors is it always, I mean, like, personally, I like both the global studies and the kind of uh, local scale. I think that both of them really have important local scale process are important to delve into the dynamics, but the global processes always give us some more insights. Uh, um, so yeah, hopefully we will have a second global project, but we're also looking for some foundings and see if, so if we can have a project that is bigger in this case and with some uh, higher kind of uh, found support for the project. So yeah, hopefully. <laughs> I look forward to hearing more about it. Thanks. I think we've come more than to the end of our time. So um, with that, I want to once again, thank you, Veronica, for an excellent lecture and also excellent uh, answers to the questions that people have raised. Um, you've obviously uh, done a lot of very important work and we look forward to seeing what you do in the future as well. Um, just before I let everyone go, um, I want to just advise you of our, our speaker next week. We're going to move into the marine environment, uh, particularly into the Nordic marine environment. And our speaker will be Dr. Claudia Halsbond, <laughs> excuse me, uh, who is with Aquaplan Neva. Uh, and she'll be talking to us about uh, microplastics in the Nordic uh, marine environment. And I also want to note that uh, we have a time change here in uh, Canada uh, this weekend. We moved to standard time. Uh, so if, for those of you who don't move to uh, standard time or who don't change time uh, at all, uh, just be cautious of the time change. It would be one hour later uh, than this. Um, and then for those of you in Europe and the UK, uh, you'll join us uh, in a couple of weeks, I think, in, in moving 
so uh, over the next two or three weeks, just be very cautious that you check the time zone. It will be Eastern Standard Time, 8 a.m. Uh, for the remainder of our lectures. So once again, thank you, Veronica. We really appreciate your efforts today. Thank you so much. It was very a pleasure. Bye, all. Bye.